How's it going, fellow traders? Magic Trader here. It's the 7th of November. Nice to have you all with me. Let me just close off my email there. Uh, good morning, good morning. 11.30. We're going to take a look at the latest set of data uh, from the institutions. We're going to take a look at this snapshot first, as I always do before I head down into the data for each individual asset. I like to take a look at the um, at a, just a, an outline of what took place over the uh, previous week. And I know a lot of people say, oh, but the data is old. Why would it matter? Well, it does matter. It does matter greatly because if you can pinpoint the themes that are in play, themes meaning what's the underlining momentum that's coming into the market? Is there profit taking and that's what's fueling moves? Is there an accumulation of a position and that's what's fueling moves? It's very important to determine what is taking place. What are the banks doing? It's always, it always comes down to what the banks are doing because the banks are the ones that move the markets, okay? We've done so many videos and I've outlined for you just how important it is to track the banks. And so that's what we do here is we track what the big institutions are doing with their positions. One great, great example of this is oil. If you take a look at what's happening with oil right now, all right, this move to the downside that we're seeing in oil is exactly what we were suspecting would take place because of what the banks are doing with their positions. Okay, so let's start by examining uh, this outlook here. <clears throat> First thing I'll point out is we wanna look at this column here. Okay, this is the change column. Can you guys see that? Okay, maybe I'll change the color. Maybe I'll change the thickness right here. This is the first column I look at, is the change. What took place from the previous week to this latest week of data? And I look at the biggest movers. <clears throat> and the biggest mover I can see is oil, minus 70,000. Like, does that come off as a bullish signal to you or a bearish signal, right? minus 70,000. So when you look at the positions from the non-commercial, which are the speculators, and you look at the numbers of uh, from the commercial, which is the uh, hedging, and you combine it together to, uh, to determine what is the overall movement of their positions, well, what we can see is that overall, the momentum was to the downside, okay, was bearish. So that could mean they're closing long positions or they're adding short positions or they're doing a little bit of each. And later on, when we take a look at oil, you're gonna see exactly why it's negative 70,000. But just briefly looking at this, when you're trying to determine what's the biggest mover right now, what market is the institutions most focused on at this moment when considering all the major currency pairs, gold, silver, copper, the SPY, the NASDAQ, bonds, and the Dow Jones. What's the biggest mover? So by just looking at this snapshot, we would see that oil is the biggest mover with a negative 70,000. All right, and so then I go to the next one. What else? I see bonds, negative 28,000, okay? What is that caused by? Is that from the reduction of long positions or increasing short positions? So we'll take a look at that later on. Then we have uh, Aussie. We have an increase of 20,000. Bullish. Then we look at gold, an increase of 30,000. Bullish. Isn't gold and the Aussie correlated together? <clears throat> yes, it is. Okay, the Aussie, US dollar and gold are correlated positively together. So it's interesting how both of those have a very strong positive change, okay? So those are the ones that stick out mostly to me, all right? So it's oil bearish, bonds bearish, gold and Aussie bullish. 
All right. <clears throat> All right. So let's take a look at gold here. So what do we see? The, the first thing I'll bring your attention to is we look at the long column. And you can see over the last uh, few weeks, there's been an increase in longs. So when you look at the CFTC data <clears throat> and you're trying to determine why it was so bullish, you also have to look at the supply and demand dynamics of what was happening on the charts. This is why when I post these charts in our Rougeau report, I put the two together because everything comes down to context, okay? And that's the one thing that people are missing when they're analyzing the CFTC data is putting things into context. And so if you have a chart and all you're looking at is a support and resistance and trend lines as drawn by um, uh, what has been taught in conventional trading uh, textbooks, uh, you're not going to get the full picture of what's really happening, okay? You're actually not gonna really see what is actually transpiring because when we're looking at the data, CFTC data, that's the positions from the largest players in the world, okay? The largest players in the world are the ones that move the markets. It's not anybody else. It's the largest players in the world. So if we see them increasing longs, we, we want to understand why they're increasing longs. What's the reason for it? Is there anything that we can see from examining the buying and selling of the banks on the charts that would help us understand why the banks were buying gold? Because most traders will just look at this data and say, oh, gold's increasing, therefore I should be a buyer of gold. Okay, is, is that really what you should be doing right now? Yes, we got an increase in gold. Why did we get that increase in gold? Well, one of the reasons why was banks were responding to an institutional buying zone that they created, right? So when demand gets contacted, we typically see buying take place. Does that mean that price is going to just rocket up and continue higher? No, it doesn't. It could mean that that's what's about to happen. But as far as the supply and demand dynamics on the charts, that's not what we are seeing right now. And for us to be able to trade something, we need to see proof, right? We need to see proof. Just because the banks are increasing their long positions and we see a big move to the upside in gold, it doesn't mean that they're going to sustain this move and continue buying, right? Right now, gold is in a range and it has been for quite some time. So in a range, there's going to be movements to the downside and there's going to be movements to the upside. So we have to recognize this. So just because the banks are accumulating along doesn't mean that they're going to continue pushing price to the upside. So that's very important to, to recognize. So the first thing we see is them increasing longs, but we also look at the weekly chart and what do we see? That they rallied price up, up off of demand. So that is telling us as price contacted demand, they increased their long positions. No surprise there. What's really important to, to understand as well is when we take a look at the short positions, what have they been doing? They've been reducing them. Why did they reduce them? Well, because price dropped into a demand area. So you see how they increased their short positions as price was dropping towards demand areas, okay? So price dropped because they increased shorts. Price contacts a demand area. what do they do? Do you think they're gonna hold on to those short positions when they know that they're gonna start buying again from a demand area? No, they close them off and they add to their longs. So in the process of reducing shorts and increasing longs, that's what causes the move up in the market. So this is where we're at right now, okay? So now we wanna determine what's the likelihood that this pressure to the upside is going to continue. And that's when I like to take a look at the sentiment here, okay? I like to look at the long percentage and the short percentage. Now. Your typical trader that is uninformed would be looking at, if they were even looking at the percentage of positions to the to the long side and short side, they would be looking at this and saying, oh, 73% of their positions are geared to the long side. So that's pretty large. So that would mean that they are likely going to continue pushing price higher because they 
have a massive long position. Well, take a look at the coloration of those cells. If you look back throughout August, September, and the beginning of October, what would the coloration of the cells here? Okay, slightly what? Slightly red. Why is that? Well, it relates exactly to what I was pointing out here. Okay, putting things into context. It was bearish because price was dropping towards a demand area. So right now it is neutral, blue, and that relates to where we're at right now. It's not bullish, it's neutral, okay? Even if you take a look at net positions, one would say, well, net positions is, is very, uh, very bullish. We're in the positives right now, positive 163,000. So isn't that bullish? Yeah, in a sense it is. But when you combine it with the sentiment being neutral, all this is saying is that comparing what we can see with the CFTC data right now to what it was previously, right now the banks are neutral with respect to gold, okay? Even though longs are aggressive, even though net positions are very positive, even though long percentage is 73%, we're still neutral, okay? We're neutral because the banks are neutral. So this wouldn't, for me, be an opportunity for me to be looking to buy gold, okay? I don't want to see that neutral. I want to see them coming out of bearishness, entering into neutral, and slowly turning into bullish. But at the same time, the chart formations, the supply and demand dynamics that I see on the charts, have to suggest that the banks are creating formations on the charts that would help to facilitate a move even higher. <clears throat> when you combine all those things together, that's what makes um, your trade a lot higher probability, okay? In this case, if looking for a long position, we would want some sort of trend to the upside, a breakthrough of ranging to the upside, a close above ranging, and so forth. Right? So I've detailed all these things in the latest Arusha report, exactly what we're looking for, what, what kind of chart formations we're looking for, and on what time frames we're looking for them in. All right. So this is gold. This is what's go going on with gold. So if you have any questions with respect to that, let me know. And if not, we'll continue moving forward. All right. How's going sport lotto 82. Hello, magic trader. Appreciate you joining me today. So here's our snapshot of gold, all right? So keep this in mind, because I, I, I constantly get questions. What do you think of gold? What do you think of gold? This is what I think of gold. And I'm giving you the reasons why I think this of gold, all right? My opinions aren't just based on, you know, what, what I think is going to happen because I just, I've been reading the, the news and seeing what the analysts have to say, and I'm looking at economic situations and coming to a determination of what I think is going to happen with gold. I'm not judging my opinions on all that other data that's out there. That, in my opinion, opinion is just used to 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 emotionally stir up uh, retail traders and investors to trade the markets uh, in, in such a way that doesn't take into consideration real raw data and real intelligent analysis of what is actually causing the markets to move. Okay? So that's what I see with uh, gold. Now let's go over to oil. So this is the one that uh, I was uh, talking about, right? Uh, when we look at um, this here, oil, biggest change was negative 70,000. Remember that? Okay, so let's go back to oil here. So what do we see with oil? Very similar situation. You remember we had an institutional demand area down here, okay? And in the Arusha reports, I've been laying out to members how price was reacting to a demand area and the bias was price was going to move to the upside, all right? And as you can tell by the clouds that I um, painted in here, to represent data, okay? Like this darker area here represents the 
aggressive accumulation of long positions by the non-commercials, okay? They got very aggressive. That's why I drew in the cloud a dark green color that represents the fact that they're very aggressive with long positions. That doesn't mean it's time to buy oil, okay? Because what will typically happen when they're aggressive with their positions is they're going to take profits on them. And that's what I was outlining to everybody, okay? You don't want to be a buyer when the banks are focusing on taking profits. So what took place from there? They became aggressive and price dropped. Why? Because they closed off their positions. That's why. And you can see it here. From highs of 469,000 down to 383,000, okay? Profit taking on longs causes price to decline. And that's why we are seeing this decline in price. This is all profit taking here, okay? Now, the last week's data that we got shows an increase of shorts from 95,000 to 121,000. That's pretty aggressive, right? Pretty aggressive. And so if you take a look at oil right now, what do we see? Price is dropping, okay? This daily chart was key, very pivotal in determining what the banks were going to do. Because again, we saw price come into a supply area that we had mapped out on the charts. And we saw that the long positions were super aggressive. Remember, they were accumulating a long position all throughout here. And at the highs, it became super aggressive with their long positions, so they needed to take profits on them. And that profit taking fueled this move to the downside. Now, interesting thing is that as they were profit taking from their positions, okay, they created what we call a supply area. The supply area was right here. Oops. It was right here. And I pointed this out to members. I said, take a look at this supply area because what's likely going to happen is price is going to go up and contact the supply area. And if they're going to continue to offload their short positions, they're going to use this area to continue filling in those, uh, those orders, okay? And so look what took place. Price came into the supply area and a big drop in price, okay? Then we came to this ascending trend line. And I posted on Twitter and on our Telegram I said, watch this trend line. It's an important trend line. They're holding price at that trend line right now. But guess what? This trend line was pretty obvious. It's a pretty obvious trend line. And you know why that's important? <clears throat> because when you have a move like that, you see how price rallied up from there? Who do you think was buying there? I mean, if you look at a conventional trading technical analysis trading manual of how to trade the markets, you'll see so many explanations of how to draw trend lines. But one of the explanations is to draw them like this. You have a point one, you have a point two. When price comes to point three, you buy. When it comes down again, you buy. When it comes down again, you buy. Because the idea is the more times a trend line is tested, the stronger it is, and the expectation is for price to go up. So think about it. The banks during this whole time were focusing on taking profits on long positions, okay? That means you need to offload those long positions to somebody, right? You need to offload those positions to somebody. So somebody was asking me earlier <clears throat> about the algorithms that the banks are using. And I can tell you after years of analyzing charts and figuring out how the banks manipulate price and create chart patterns uh, to help facilitate their positions, I've come to determine that the algorithms that the banks are using are programmed to create chart formations and patterns that we can recognize very well because all the textbooks tell you what, how they look like and what to do when you see these chart patterns. And guess what? The banks needed people to take their long positions from them, right? So who do you think was buying here? Well, I already told you. 
Who do you think was buying here? Well, I already told you. Who do you think was buying here? Well, I already told you. So do you see the reality of what's going on here? Do you see how if you actually take the raw data and the supply and demand dynamics and you put it all into one basket and you examine it to determine what's really taking place, you'll see very clearly that the banks needed retail traders to come in to help them offload those long positions that they were holding to the retail trader. So the retail trader is buying at the test of this trend line, hoping that it's going to go up and up and up and up and up. And they're, and they're seeing all these articles in the news as to why oil should go up. All perfectly timed as well. It's just, it's remarkable. It's remarkable when you start seeing price action coming down to test an ascending trend line within the context of the banks needing to offload a long position. And then you look at the articles and you see a ton of them pointing in the direction that and insinuating that oil is likely going to go up. Okay. In this case, it's because of what's happening across the world from us, or at least for me. So when you put all these things together, it starts to paint a very clear picture of what's really taking place in the markets. Oil tests that trend line. I said to everybody, watch the, that ascending trend line. If it breaks to the downside <clears throat> and closes below that trend line, that's going to give us an indication that price is going to drop. Okay. And so look what took place here. Price closed below it. And look what's happening with price right now. Okay. We're coming into a demand area here, which I suspect will likely break. And do you see anything in here between this area and here? Any institutional buying zones? No, I don't see any. So you know what that means? Once this area breaks, guess what? Price will drop down here very easily. Because what's happening now is once the banks offload their long positions, they're going to start doing something new. And if you want to trade in the direction of what the banks are doing and you want to be profitable, you have to do what they are doing. So you have to understand what phase of the market is playing out right now. Right now it's profit taking, so no accumulation. They accumulated a little bit over the last week, okay, in shorts. Is it sustainable? Who knows? But because the main theme is profit taking, that's going to fuel a move to the downside. So downside pressure is what we're expecting. Once that settles down, once they offload the amount of positions that they want, then we're going to see what they're going to uh, start doing next, whether they're going to start buying or accumulate a, a larger short position. We don't know that yet, but we're going to have to be patient and see what the next phase is going to be. Okay. Uh, any questions? Let's see. So Tommy writes, uh, update new data. I think already released. Saw this old data. Yes, this is the latest data that we're talking about. Okay. It's the data that came out on Friday. So uh, Friday was the third and it's um, October 31st data that was recorded and reported to the CFTC, okay? Um, WWE for life, retail traders have no power to move the market. No, they don't have any power. The only time I've seen retail traders actually make moves in the markets is when uh, they're being lured emotionally. And that's um, in areas where exactly where I was pointing out here, the test of the trend line, okay? where um, you'll see a little bit of a bullish pressure form from that. But many times when price comes down to test those trend lines, what you'll also see is the banks coming in to help instigate, okay? They, they come and instigate that move to the upside. They come in and, and fill in some long positions, just enough to get price moving so that retail traders can be emotionally triggered to buy off of those trend lines. The other times you'll see it is when data is released, okay? when um, there's increases or decreases in um, uh, interest rates or NFP and that type of stuff, okay? 
because everybody's told to sit and watch the data, and if it's positive, buy, and if it's negative, sell. So everybody's doing the same thing, okay? They want quick money, right? So they think, oh, it's so simple. You just wait for the data to come out positive and then buy, and then wait for it to rally and then, you know, close your position off and take profits. Everybody thinks it's that simple. Oh. So when you have uh, millions of people coming in and buying all at the same time, yeah, you're gonna see that bullish pressure. And the banks will sit back and allow it to happen so that when price gets to a certain level, they'll come in and smack price in the opposite direction with their orders, okay? With like a massive amount of their orders. So this is how the markets move. All right, so that's oil. I wanted to cover that one because that was uh, one of the larger move movers. US dollar, well, what do we see here? What's being contacted here? supply area okay price rallied spent many weeks in that supply area and now we're getting this uh, push to the downside right there all right and it's paused so we covered this one in great detail for members with respect to what we are uh, watching for and what is likely going to take place so um, what I can show you is that over here uh, sentiment is bullish but that's only because price significantly rallied so it's not a good representation of what we should expect this week. So in terms of, you know, how do you use this data so you could day trade, for instance? Well, you have to understand the broader theme of the markets, and that's how you can pinpoint, you know, trades on the daily time frame. You wouldn't be looking at this and saying, oh, the sentiment is bullish, so I should day trade it to the upside. That's not how you use it. It's about painting a bigger picture, like oil. You could have shorted oil. So many opportunities to short oil. Lots of day trades, swing trades to short oil. But it was with the understanding that the theme was profit taking on long positions and then reading the supply and demand and looking at the dynamics of what was taking place and then, you know, pinpointing your opportunities to take advantage of the move. That's how you use it. Okay? Aussie, big move to the upside. We're within uh, institutional demand right now. The main thing that they've been focusing on is shorts, and they have been for a very long time. As you can see with the clouds that I've drawn in here, very aggressive with shorts, they profit take on shorts, which causes a move up. Then aggressive with shorts again, they profit take on shorts, and we have that move up again, all right? You can see that, profit taking on shorts. What fuels moves to the upside on the Aussie is profit taking on shorts. So are they focusing on longs? Not in the least. Not at this time. Okay? And you can see that. Look at the coloration here. Blue. That means they're neutral. The banks are neutral with their long positions, so they're not focusing on longs. So any rally that takes place, you should not be thinking about buying the Aussie because the banks are not focused on that. If they're not focused on it, believe me, it's not going to work out in your favor. You can pray to whatever you want to pray to, but it's not going to work out in your favor. You may get lucky with short-term trades, but you have to understand the, the overall theme that's in play. And if the supply and demand dynamics suggest that a, a move in a certain direction is high odds, then take a trade. Okay, I took a trade on gold short because of what I put together and determined we were likely going to see a drop in gold. And we got that over the last couple of days. Okay, we got that drop in gold. But was that a high probability trade? No, it wasn't a high probability trade. But because I looked at the data, the supply and demand dynamics, I determined we're, we're likely going to get a drop from that supply area that we contacted. And so that's what took place. All right, so US CAD, uh, all US dollar pairs are weak right now. Okay, but the overall theme that we've been looking at with respect to the dollars is a bullish sentiment, okay? Look at longs and shorts, look at the sentiment, look at the coloration of the cells, bullish. Look at short positions, cooled off. Look at long positions, aggressive. For right now, for the time being, we're seeing a move to the downside, weakness, all right? So timing this one is going to be tricky, but as I laid out for members, there there is going to be indications of when we could trade this one again. But 
I'm sticking with this bullish theme on the US dollar. Um, and we got indications of this bullish theme with the US dollar by looking and examining the US dollar Japanese yen chart, okay? That's one of the beautiful things about these correlated markets. Because when you are drawing the supply and demand, locating the zones that price is reacting to, and examining the supply and demand dynamics to determine what is the likely direction price is going to head into, months ago we looked at the US dollar Japanese yen and we saw signals that price was going to move higher. So US dollar Japanese yen isn't going to move by itself. It could move with greater momentum than the other, uh, the other US dollar pairs, but it's not going to move by itself. All right. So that's why we were looking at the US dollar and determining that we were likely going to see it, it continue to move to the upside. And so you see that now. OK, you see what took place here. All right. So now it's on pause. Well, we did get a big move to the upside. So now we got to wait. We got to wait until price settles down, starts to build momentum, and then we'll likely continue uh, to, to see price head to the upside. Unless things drastically change and anything can happen. But when we're looking at the flow of the market right now, what are the banks doing? What are they putting their positions in? What 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 sentiment is 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 it becoming? We're starting to see a clear picture of what uh, the flow of the market is. Uh, U.S. Swiss will pass through that. Let's go on to the Euro U.S. dollar. I know you guys love the Euro U.S. dollar and I do too. It's a great market. One of the um, most heavily traded markets is the Euro. And um, so when we look at what's taking place here, let's put things into perspective once again. First off, let's look at long positions here. Remember when they were 264,000, we said they were going to take some profits. Price was up here. You think they took profits? Yeah, I'd say so. Would you not say that a large percentage of the reason why this move came uh, took place to the downside was from profit taking on large uh, on longs? Yes, I would. But I would I would also point to you how since the beginning of September the banks have been also increasing their short positions. So they're taking profits on longs and they're increasing short positions. Now I'm going to show you something else. Let's look at the positions here. Okay, the percentages. 75, 76, 77, 78. Okay, upwards to 80% long. What are they positioning them now? 73, 70, 68, 65, 61. Okay. You see the dramatic shift from near 80% to now low 60%. That's, that's dramatic. That's a dramatic shift. And not just that, but take a look at this here. Look how dark green these cells were. 178,000 net positions. Now we're at 85. More than half reduced their net positions more than half and this is this is a sustained long-term move that we're seeing here this is not just something that took place over a few weeks you know this is something that they're doing week after week after week after week and remember when you're talking about the largest institutions in the world trading the markets they take a long time to move positions they take a long time to offload positions and accumulate positions. Look, July 25th, shorts were 73,000. Okay? Shorts were 73,000. <clears> it's, it's practically doubled. But it took July, August, September, October to get there. Okay? So it takes time. So the good thing is people say... Oh, but the data is late. What do you mean by late? They don't shift positions in a week. It takes months. So when you can build up a theme of what is taking place, this is so essential. When you're looking to trade and you want to be profitable, 
you have to be in line with the theme that's in play. Otherwise, you're going to be caught on the wrong side. And if you're managing a portfolio, a large portfolio, a small portfolio, whatever you're managing, you want to get into positions and you want to hold them and you want price to just move in your direction a great amount. Why is that? Because you can enter in with small risk and the upside is humongous. That's why. Okay. Because you want to time the markets. You know, we're seeing a rally up in the euro. But if you could time the markets and look at the smaller time frames and watch for momentum to shift back down to the downside, because you know that the overall theme is that the banks are taking profits on longs and accumulating a short position. So the likelihood is that price is going to continue down, right? That's the likelihood based on the data, thinking about it logically, processing and analyzing the data, you come to a conclusion. Logically, the outcome is we're likely going to see a continuation of a move to the downside. That's logically based on exactly what is has been taking place over several months. OK. Now, could something change over the next month where drastically we see them close out their shorts and reaccumulate longs? Sure, that could happen. And the first place we're going to see that is on the charts. We'll be looking at the lower time frames, not monthly, weekly charts, but like daily four hour charts. We'll see the signs of that. And if there's any indication that they're going to switch this from being a bearish theme to being a bullish theme, we're going to see it on the charts. And those formations will prevent us from entering into a short position. But if we see a continuation of this theme, that they're going to start to build momentum uh, back to the downside after this uh, rally up in price. We'll see it on the charts and we'll be able to pinpoint that zone that is likely going to be used to fuel a move to the downside. So great opportunity. Enter into positions with small risk. You get in with a small position. As it plays out in your favor, you add to your position. So you're not adding to a loser. Like when you look at retail traders and their positioning, you constantly see how they are adding to a loser. They, they enter in longs, price continues to drop. They continue to enter in longs, price continues to drop. Until they're so maxed out with longs, what just happened recently with the euro? They were 80% short as price was rallying. They kept, kept on increasing shorts, increasing shorts. Price kept on rallying, 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 rallying. That was one of the indications to me that gold was likely going to drop. And that's why I took a short. And that's why the trade was profitable because of that. There's themes within themes. This theme was retail traders accumulating a massive short as price continues up. Eventually, they're going to be so maxed out on shorts, they're going to have to close out their shorts. They're going to switch their positions to longs. And then guess what they're going to do with price? They're going to drop it. And that's what they did. The banks dropped the euro. OK, so this is what I'm seeing with euro. This is the overall theme. And uh, I've pinpointed to members uh, what we'll be looking for. And I'll be updating charts uh, for them on the forum, the school forum, the structures that are being built um, and looking at indications whether or not the banks will continue to push price to the downside or whether or not or whether they're going to continue uh, pushing price to the upside. OK. Uh, any questions on that? Let's see some of your comments. I find it interesting. Non-commercial longs are decreasing as non-reportable increases. Um, hello, Magic Trader. I like the way you analyze the market. Can you recommend us some good books about how institution or banks work? Thank you very much. Uh, I get asked that a lot. If there's any good books out there. Um, I have personally not seen any books that I've read. Um, that detail what I'm explaining to you, all right? All this that I've learned is from my own hard work and studying of the markets, applying principles of analysis, applying logic, critical thinking uh, to come to conclusions and then um, and then creating forecasts of the markets, applying those um, uh, principles and and uh, and concepts that we teach here at the school, applying them applying the logic of what I've come to learn about the markets and sitting back and watching it play out and realizing that um, 
the markets when you think of it logically and you are focused on the themes that are in play and the supply and demand dynamics, price will typically move in the direction that you conclude. So over the years, I've tweaked my system and my thinking and the logic that is applied. And over the years, I'm just becoming more and more and more accurate with my analysis. So I personally haven't seen a book out there um, that really delves into this because like I said, I've created the, the this system. I've created um, this way of analyzing the charts. So you wanna learn, uh, join the school and Watch the video lessons, learn how to do the supply and demand uh, analysis, uh, read the Arusha reports that we do, and, and you'll see for yourself. Um, and, and that's the way to learn, okay? Join a Telegram channel, see the, uh, the news articles that I post and the analysis that I do on them. And the more you are surrounding yourself with this type of analysis, the more the light bulb is going to start going off in your own head. And then your, your thinking about the markets is going to change, okay? And you're going to watch the news and you're going to, you know, when I watch the news, it's always with the underlying knowledge of what the theme is that's in play, okay? So when I detach from my computer screens and I sit and I put on the news and I'm watching Bloomberg and I'm watching the experts and I'm seeing the headlines, it's always with the understanding of what the real theme is that's in play. And I just sit back to, to see what it is that they're saying how they say it, the words that they use, the analysts that they bring on, what those analysts say. And I'm always trying to figure out why they're saying what they're saying. How does that fit into the grand scheme of what's uh, playing out? And it's just, it's remarkable. There's revelations that come that, you know, there's so many that I just can't, I don't have the time to sit and list them all. But you enter into this world of thinking your mind's going to change. Your brain is going to shift. <clears throat> You're going to start thinking of the markets differently. And then when you go and scan through the news and you watch the news, you'll start to see how what you're what you're being presented and how it plays in the overall theme of what's taking place in the markets. It's it's fascinating. Absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Okay, that's the euro. Um Pound, similar theme that's in play, you can see, and I pointed this out. This one's a remarkable chart, remarkable. And the data is telling us so much. And I, I pointed this out in great detail for the members' videos. So if you're a member, you can watch that. Uh, US do dollar, Japanese yen, very, very interesting chart, what we have here. Uh, I pointed out, <clears throat> excuse me, I pointed out um, months ago, when price was here, that the banks were going to take profits. Okay, and that's what they did. Then they started to accumulate longs again, as you can see. All right, and then profit taking from this supply zone has been the um, latest theme. But price is within a range here, and we suspect that over time price is going to break out the upside. That's our that is our bias because of everything that the data is representing and what the supply and uh, and, and demand dynamics is suggesting. Okay, so that leads us to suspect that over time dollar pairs are going to go higher, right? And that's in perfect correlation to what we're seeing with the euro. Okay, and everything else that I just mentioned with the euro. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, Kiwi. Anybody trade the Kiwi? I haven't been for a long time because there's nothing interesting here. Okay, so I'll pass through that. S&P 500. So when we look at the positions, we can see something here. Okay, net positions. Aggressive, 434,000. That was back in May, right here. Back in May, aggressive, okay? But we were dropping at that point. Okay, all throughout this area here. Okay, 434,000. What is net positions now? We're in the positive. We just entered into the positive. For the first time in a long time, we just entered into the positive, okay? If you look at the coloration of the cells here though, and you should be, it's very important. What do you see? What, what color? 
Mm. You see blue. And what has been for a long time, red. So we're not entering into bullish territory right now in terms of the sentiment held by the largest uh, banks in the world. We're entering into a neutral, okay? Even though we are seeing bullish signals and the data is suggesting bullishness, that sentiment indicator is telling us be neutral. As much as you want to be bullish, be neutral. We've gone from bearish to neutral. We can go back into bearish. It wouldn't take much to go back into bearish territory at this point. So it's like gold, okay? You got to be patient and let the structures be built. The charts will tell us the story. Maybe not so much the monthly and the weekly chart at this at this time, but daily chart, oh, for sure. It's going to tell us a story because if the banks are going to start accumulating, guess what? We're going to see it on the charts. We're going to see the structures being built. We're going to see the demand coming in. So right now we're focusing on those time frames and those charts to look for the indications that they want to bring this market higher. It is possible that they do, but we're just not there yet. Okay. We're in neutral territory. So something to uh, to consider going forward when looking at stocks and stuff. And, and we've already accumulated some positions in some great dividend paying stocks, which I've shared with members. Uh, I've already started accumulating because even if the market was to drop, even if the stock market was to drop, these stocks that we purchased, they are solid companies paying solid dividends and prices responding to massive, massive buying zones. What's a massive buying zones? Well, you know those super wealthy families that are out there, the old money, as we like to call them, the old money families who have billions and billions of dollars invested in the markets? Well, they like to buy uh, dividend paying stocks, okay? They make their income from dividend paying stocks, okay? Amongst other things, businesses and real estate and so forth. But there are families that they take an income from the dividends that they get by purchasing stocks of companies that pay good dividends. And when there's massive buying zones on the charts that we locate, that means a large percentage of money were buying those stocks at those lows. Okay? Not at the highs. They like to buy them at the lows. And so... We located some of those buying zones on some really good stocks, and I created the watch list for the 100 top 100 stocks on the YouTube uh, channel. You can scan through it and you'll see top 100 dividend paying stocks. And we did the supply and demand dynamics of, of those stocks, and we located some uh, high probability buying zones, and uh, we waited for price to drop to them. We were just patient. Price was heading towards it, and we said, Listen, let's not buy now because price is heading towards a demand area. Why don't we wait until it gets into those demand zones and then we buy? And then we know what risks we have. If the demand zone breaks, then that means we get out of our position. But because these demand zones exist on higher time frames, which mean it took a long time for shares to be accumulated in those uh, at those levels, it's because a lot of money needed to come in and buy those those shares okay a lot of market manipulation a lot of headlines have to come out and convince retail traders to offload their shares to the big money that wanted to accumulate them so now price dropped back to those areas and i started to accumulate some of those shares for myself and for the accounts that i trade on behalf of my children i've accumulated some of those shares and i've shared that with uh, members of the uh, school so so looking at this, we're in neutral territory, so I'm not bullish yet. Uh, I did buy those stocks because even if the market was going to be bearish, those stocks are likely going to hold those areas of demand. And then eventually when the market is bullish again, those stocks are going to shoot up like a rocket. But in terms of looking for uh, momentum to, to really be behind stocks right now, you know, I'm not there yet with it. Okay, it's neutral. It's a good sign. Months, months in the making here. Okay, all year. All year, switching from bearish to neutral, okay? And that position is showing positive. So that's great. Great sign. All right. Uh, silver, we'll skip that. Natural gas, we'll skip that. Uh, bonds. Bonds. 
Remember, uh, our, our friend Bill Ackman came out and said that he shorted bonds. And guess what? Everybody and their grandmother shorted bonds. Okay. But remember what I was telling you. Banks were aggressive with their shorts. Let's zoom in here a little bit. Banks were aggressive with their shorts. And then Bill Ackman came out and said, I'm going to short. So guess what? The banks use that as an opportunity to offload their shorts. <laughs> okay, interesting how that works, isn't it? And so um, then they offload their shorts. Recently, they added back up again. So we're at the lows here. We have institutional supply right here. You want to know what's going to happen with bonds? You watch that zone. That's my advice. You watch that zone. And then you'll know what's going to happen with bonds. Now, there's a lot of articles out there. I read one with respect to Warren Buffett. He went majorly into cash. Why do you think he went majorly into cash over the last several months? Well, because when you look at the markets and you looked at uh, a lot of technology companies, a lot of big corporations, and you looked at, um, you went to openinsider.com and you looked at what the, uh, the CEOs and the executives were doing with their positions. They were all taking profits on their stock. Why do you think they do that? Well, because they buy low, and when their stock is overvalued, they sell it. And they wait for it to drop again, and then they reinvest in, in their shares. That's what they do. And so, being that so many insiders are doing that with the markets, Warren Buffett did the same thing. And he turned to cash. Why? Because maybe he sees opportunities coming. You know, when you look at the supply and demand dynamics on many charts, there's massive supply zones that are being contacted. Massive. Which means pressure is going to be to the downside. Okay? <clears throat> and then when pressure is to the downside, is that when you want to be buying? No. You want to be buying when price enters into buying zones. Areas where the banks were previously buying, where the old money were previously buying. So I think he, I think he turned to cash simply because... Well, maybe one of the reasons is because he was selling at the highs and looking for opportunities to buy again at the lows. Now, he also shifted a lot of money into bonds. OK, bonds are, you know, all time, not all time lows, but like historical lows. If you look at, you know, previous price action, you can see we're, we're down there. So for me to really uh, be biased to the long side. I'm watching this supply zone here on the monthly chart because that's the latest area where significant selling was taking place. So price is either going to rally up to that selling area and drop, or guess what? What's the other outcome? Rally up to that supply area and what? Look, there's, no there's nothing to stop it from rallying up to the 114s if it takes out that area at 100 bucks. 114s. Okay, so I'm watching that, I'm watching the data, and watching to see what's going to take place. There hasn't been enough momentum on the longs for me to be super excited about going long bonds. I like the fact that Warren Buffett's getting in. I like the fact that, um, that we're seeing momentum to the upside, but I would like it better if this supply was removed and we started seeing more aggressiveness on the long side with respect to bonds. Okay. Makes sense, guys? All logical? Okay. All logical. Uh, let me see. Thank you very much for the time and information. You're welcome, my friend. You are right. Yes, I do. Where can I get this data you are showing here? Uh, the CFTC website. Okay. CFTC.gov. All the data is there. It's, and I've done videos. Just scan through my YouTube channel. And you'll see videos of where to collect the data, how to put it together, and all that stuff. Okay? I have it all there for you guys. And if you want to learn more, get more in-depth of how to uh, read the data, combine it with the supply and demand dynamics, look for high probability trading opportunities, or you just want to join a community of, um, of progressive um, analysts, who are using in brand new techniques, concepts, and principles that are time-tested, proven, with incredible results, 
and you want to align yourself with a new way of thinking about the markets that will uh, uh, over time bring you success if you work hard enough to achieve the skills and the thinking required uh, to apply to this um, market so that you can be successful, join our school. Okay. If you don't want to put the work and effort that's required to do the analysis on your own, then join the school and use the analysis that we provide. It's your choice. Like I had mentioned a couple weeks back, I have a money manager and um, he just recently, uh, he's been a member since I started the school. He was following me before I even uh, had a school. And when I uh, set up the school, he contacted me and said, hey, just want to let you know you're doing great work. I've been in the business for a long time and and your work is is right up there with some of the best that I've ever seen. And I was like, floored, completely floored. And he's very quiet, sticks to himself. He reads the Arugia report and he uses it for his analysis for his uh, hedge fund. And just the other week, he wrote to me and told me that his hedge fund is listed as one of the top 1% of all hedge funds in the world in terms of performance. And he thanked me because he said that the analysis that I provide in the Arugia report uh, played a role in that success of his. So, you know, it's amazing stuff what we're doing. And the only way to really see it is uh, to join the school and, and see the uh, the video lessons that we have, the past classroom sessions that we've done, and read the reports uh, diligently every single week and gather the, uh, the knowledge that you need. All right, folks, that's it. I'll leave you with that. A good one hour session. I hope you got something out of it pretty sure you did and um, I'll leave you with that all right come join us on telegram for uh, the, the conversation to continue all right take care have a good one and uh, so long <laughs>